Okay. Uh, last time we talked about um, infrastructures required for uh, big data processing. Today I will continue with them. One important component in this, uh, infra I mean, maybe the infrastructure itself is uh, Hadoop. Uh, let's talk about Hadoop. <clears throat> okay. You have a problem, how to scale up your applications. You run jobs processing hundreds of terabytes uh, of data. It will take days to read on a single computer. So you may need lots of cheap computers to parallelize this uh, speed problem, to solve the speed problem. Um, like if you use the, if you do the same task that takes days on a single computer, let's say on thousand computers, it will take 15 minutes. Uh, it's a lot of difference. However, so of course you can always parallelize tasks to make them faster. But if you do that, you run into reliability problems. Because as I said before, more components you have in your system, very likely that one of them will fail every day or, or will fail soon, okay? So if you have one computer, for instance, it will fail once in uh, a year. If you have 600 and uh, 365 computers, one of them might fail a day. So, so you simply increase the odds of failure. Um, and if you have a lot of computer, computers at hand to do some specific tasks, you need a common infrastructure to manage them because, I mean, even managing a single computer is difficult sometimes. Imagine you have hundreds of computers. How can you uh, manage them efficiently? It is humanly not possible. Um, for that, there's a solution called Hadoop. It's, uh, I mean, one of the solutions that I say that way. Um, it's an open source Apache project. Uh, it is um, a framework, it's an open source framework. It is from Apache uh, for storage and large scale processing of data sets on clusters of commodity hardware. This is the important part. You don't need a special computer to run Hadoop. It simply works on commodity uh, hardware. Um, it has two basic components in its core, distributed file system, HDFS, and MapReduce is a programming paradigm to distribute applications. It runs on Linux, Mac OS, Windows, and Solaris, and on commodity hardware. Repeat, commodity hardware is you can simply buy, is a hardware you can simply buy, you can simply access, it's not for Mm, huge prices, okay. That's we call this a commodity hardware cluster architecture. The nodes of the cluster here, the nodes are ordinary commodity PCs, okay. And they are connected with this green lines, a simple network. They are connected by switches. Maybe among those switches, you may have a faster connection, but that's it. It's not a special hardware. You can simply buy this hardware from vendors for reasonable prices. What is Hadoop again? Uh, it is uh, an architecture for large scale computation and data processing on a network of commodity hardware. What is it good for? Data intensive text processing, like, um, okay, I'm not giving an example now. Um, 
assembly of large genomes, graph mining, uh, machine learning and data mining, large social network analysis, of course. <coughs> and for many other things. Who uses Hadoop? Many big companies are using Hadoop. Let's talk about a little history. It was created by Dow Cutting and Mike Caffarella in 2005. So you see it's already quite old. Uh, Cutting was working at Yahoo at that time and named this uh, after his son's toy elephant. The guy had, has a son, had a son at that, I mean, actually before 2005. And he was calling uh, his baby elephant as uh, Yahoo, uh, Hadoop, sorry, <laughs> Hadoop. So Hadoop doesn't mean anything. It's just a, just a, just what a kid says, what the kid calls uh, his uh, toy. And the guy was uh, saving this name for something good. Okay. So this happened in late 90s, as far as I remember. And so for a computer scientist, it's always like, you come up with a nice name and you try to buy a domain name for that because you think that you will eventually uh, develop an application for that and, and make a lot of money. Most of the time it doesn't uh, come true, but this time it did. An example Hadoop cluster is uh, from Yahoo on the screen. You see there are a lot of racks. Um, we call these as racks. There are computers on the shelves of these, these racks. Okay. So, and you see the cabling is nicely done. You don't see cables around here. It's nicely climated room. So this is a typical data center server room. And we talk about racks most of the time now. Um, of course, there are more than probably, I wouldn't say more than 20,000 machines, but so cores or virtual machines are also counted anyhow. Uh, Yahoo doesn't create or Google doesn't create a single cluster for uh, containing all of its uh, computers, of course. So they come up with clusters with, let's say, 2,000 nodes, 3,000 nodes, so on and so forth. So there are several clusters in Yahoo's data center. Several petabytes of user data, petabyte comes after terabytes and hundreds of thousands of jobs every month. So remember, I showed you what is happening in internet in a minute. So it is happening because of these clusters, basically. Um, first success of this uh, Hadoop thing and there was a competition like sorting, who is going to sort? Uh, Jim Gray's sort benchmark. I mentioned about this guy, uh, was very important in database transactions. Um, you can see, Hadoop sorts a petabyte in 16, almost 16 hours, and a terabyte in 62 seconds. It's a little over than a minute, okay? So this is huge. Actually, this was huge when it happened for the first time. It is now ordinary, but that time it was really huge. What makes this possible is basically at this, uh, 
using a distributed system. We are distributing processing so that parallelize things. Um, there are things with these distributed systems. It allows developers to use multiple machines for a single task. Good. You think your program is working on a single computer. In fact, it doesn't. Um, programming on a distributed system is much more complex. Yes, you need to synchronize data exchanges, for instance. If it was up to you completely, so you need an abstraction layer so that you don't care about these details. You don't need to care about the synchronization, uh, managing uh, bandwidth, uh, controlling computation time, whatever. Okay. Actually, that is the idea. We don't want to care about this stuff. It has to be handled by something else, so by the underlying framework. That's why we use such frameworks most of the time. Distributed systems must be designed with the expectation of failure. As I said, if you have more comp components in your system, it is very likely that some of them will fail. A distributed system is one that prevents you from working because of the failure of a machine that you had never heard of by Leslie Lampert. Obviously, this is an important guide in this distributed systems. You can look it up for him. Partial failures. So we said you have a lot of components in your system, in your cluster, in this, in, in this example, Hadoop example. Failure of a single component must not cause the failure of the entire system but it may cause a degradation of the application performance. So let's say you have thousand components in your cluster and one of them failed. The cluster should continue to work, but maybe the performance of that cluster will degrade. We don't know that. Failure should not result in the loss of any data. If a component fails in a cluster, we shouldn't lose any data. If a component fails, it should be able to recover without restarting the entire system. So you see, it will be a pain. If you have thousands of components and one of them fails, then you have to restart all those thousands of components. It's not acceptable. And component failure or recovery during a job must not affect the final output. Good. Scalability. In Turkish, ölçeklenebilirlik. Increasing resources should increase load capacity. Increasing the load on the system should result in a graceful decline in performance for all jobs, but not a system failure. Hadoop, uh, based on work done by Google in early 2000s, maybe you heard about this Google file system and MapReduce. Uh, the core idea was to distribute the data it is, as it is initially stored. Okay. So each node can then perform computation on the data it stores without moving the data for the initial processing. Okay, that is the point. We don't want to move huge data. And when we talk about big data processing, we talk about huge data. We are talking about uh, uh, maybe hundreds of gigabytes, at least uh, terabytes, petabytes. Just try to download a data which is a terabyte long. So you will see how long it will take on your personal computer. I mean, if you have that space in, on your hand disk, of course, you can always try that. It takes a lot of time. Um, in the Hadoop ecosystem, there are several components you may like. Uh, Ambari, Auro, Cassandra, Shukwa, whatever it is. 
HBase, Hive, Mahout, Big Zookeeper. You may have heard Cassandra, HBase, Hive, Pig, and there's, there are some well-known components. There are less known components, and they there are probably more components in the Hadoop ecosystem. You just take a look at what is uh, what exists in the Hadoop ecosystem. You don't have to know the details of these tools, of course, but I like you to be familiar about this. For instance, if I say what is Cassandra, you should say. It's a scalable multi-master database with no single point of failure. Is the, what kind of database it is, you should say that. <coughs> As I said, there are two components. Uh, we will start with HDFS. The Hadoop distributed file system is a distributed file system designed to run on commodity hardware. It is highly fault tolerant and is designed to be deployed on low cost hardware. It provides high throughput access to application data and is suitable for applications that have large data sets. Okay, that's the summary. How do we make something fault tolerant if it is a storage? They probably make copies of data, right? It pursues a master slave model. There are two types of nodes here in the Hadoop uh, HDFS, HDFS, sorry. There is a name node, and there are data nodes, and there are files. Each file consists of blocks. Okay, 64 megabytes by default, each file. So you can think of the, the size of these files. And by default, Hadoop creates three copies of each block and distributes those nodes among the, the cluster, among the data nodes. So you see, three copies of block number one, three copies of block number two, three copies of block number three. Of, of course, you can increase this. It is called replication factor. By default, it is three. You can make it five if you like, you can make it 10. But if you increase this factor, you will lose space, right? Okay, let's assume this guy fails. You can still access file one, block one, two, three, and four. You see, it provides fault tolerance. As of Hadoop 2.0, it is possible to make a cluster of name nodes. Actually, it's not a single point of failure anymore. You could create a standby name node and if there's something wrong with the name node, uh, the failure takes takes place. Okay, so if you are a client, you go to name node first, you say I want to read file one and the name node tells you that you can find blocks of this file on these on node one, on node two, three, or four, whatever. It's some, it simply parallelize the task. Let's say this is the client. <clears throat> you, don't, you don't go to data nodes directly. You go to the name node, you ask the name node where I can find these, this file, and name node tells you where to find them and you get them. Okay. This is how it works. So the whole idea is to create copies of blocks and then spread them among the cluster. How do we do that? Or how, do, how does Hadoop do that? Uh, 
how does it place the blocks? So files are split into fixed size blocks, 64 megabyte by default, and stored on data nodes. Data blocks are replicated for fault tolerance and fast access, default is three. And the important question is where to put a given block by default. Remember we have racks. This is a rack. This is another rack. This is another rack. First, let's say these are the nodes on the racks. Okay. First copy is written to the node creating the file. Let's say this is the guy who created the, the file. It has the first copy. The second copy is written to the data node within the same rack. Let's say copy one, copy two. Why? Because within the same rack, access is faster, right? You don't go through a switch. There's a, I mean, of course, there is a switch within the uh, within the rack, but it is faster than going outside. The third copy is written to a data node in a different rack. Let's say this one. Why? This is for fault tolerance. Let's say. Um, Um, okay, let's say this guy fails. You can simply keep accessing this one. Let's say this rack fails. You can use this copy. So there is still fault tolerance. That's why we put the third copy on a different node in a, in a different on a node in a different rack. How about selection? So we write uh, we write data blocks by using these these three rules. How about reading them? Selecting replicas to minimize global bandwidth consumption and read latency. HDFS tries to satisfy a read request from a replica that is closest to the reader. Okay, so HDFS or name node tries to choose the the closest replica okay so let's say if there's a replica on the same rack as the reader node then that replica is preferred uh, if an hdfs cluster spans multiple data centers this is also possible then a replica that is resident in the local data center is preferred over any remote replica so it looks for a, a replica within the rec, within the same rack. If there is none, uh, it goes to another rack within the data center. If there is none, it goes to the other uh, data center on another city to get the data. How about disk failures? So if you have a lot of components, probability of fail, one of them will fail increases mathematically. Uh, each data node sends a heartbeat message to the name node periodically. I'm alive, I'm alive, I'm alive. Uh, the name node marks data nodes without recent heartbeats as dead and does not forward any new I requests to them. Okay, this might have failed or yes this is this might be a case but there may be a problem with the the network as well it doesn't matter if there is no heartbeat uh, that not considered dead any data that was registered to a dead data node is not available to hdfs anymore okay data node that may cause the replication factor of some blocks to fall below the specified value yeah, if the if the if the node fails, so we can't count those um, blocks anymore. So okay, I will get back to this one. Um, let's say 
this node failed, okay? So you see, we have, we have data blocks, one, two, three, four. We had three copies for each. If I lose this node, I lose one copy of one. So I have three copies. Two, sorry, two copies and two copies. And the replication factor was three. If this is the case, Hadoop detects such nodes and creates a copy. for these, of these blocks on different nodes. Maybe uh, it can create a block number three here. Uh, we need to create four and we need to create one. Now the replication factor is satisfied by all nodes again. Good. How about this was simply a network failure? Um, and the guy is online now. The problem was resolved. resolved. Now I have four copies of these blocks, which is greater than replication factor. This is not uh, acceptable, so I do paste to delete one copy. I mean, very likely it will delete these, but there is no guarantee on that. And then now we have three copies of each block again. Okay, all these things are done automatically. You don't have to do anything. This is the nice thing about Hadoop, this HDFS. Okay. Um, cluster rebalancing, so we don't want to overload some nodes. But all rebalancing schemes completely uh, applied to Hadoop 8, it's not realized. A scheme must automatically move data from one data node to another if the free space on a data node falls below a certain threshold. This is done, okay. Um, in the event of sudden or sudden high demand for a particular file, a scheme might dynamically create additional replicas and rebalance other, other data in the cluster. It was not available uh, in the Hadoop. Uh, when I created these slides, maybe it is available now. I don't know. You can check that. But these are the these are things that we consider regarding cluster rebalancing. <coughs> okay. So we are doing big data processing, right? So there is a, I mean a general workflow for that. You load data, analyze data, store results in the cluster, re read the results from the cluster, if you are using Hadoop. So you see HDFS uh, plays role in, the, in three of those steps in the workflow. For the analyzing the data part, we have something called MapReduce. Um, MapReduce is to parallelize computation. It's a computation paradigm, actually. So let's talk about uh, talk on an example to understand this MapReduce thing. Grep is a command on Unix. You can try this. You search for a string. Use it to search for a string. Uh, let's say you have a very big data. Instead of running grab command on this very huge data file, uh, we split the data file into small manageable pieces, then execute grab, find matches in the file, and you can simply use the cat command on Unix again to 
uh, concatenate the results, then you have all matches. But the thing here is you, um, you split data into manageable pieces and execute the grab command on these pieces in parallel. You can uh, count words in a file. The same thing, instead of running this your algorithm on this uh, very big data, you split it into small pieces and execute count, time counts, and merge the, the counts, and you have the result. This is basically the uh, this is basically how MapReduce works. You have a very big data, you have a map uh, phase and a reduce phase, and then you have results. Uh, map means uh, you create key value pairs, okay? And then you use key value pairs to reduce them, okay? Uh, Let's go to an example to better understand this. This is the model. Um, okay, I will go over the example. I just want to give you an idea about MapReduce if you want to know the details, it's up to you. Um, let's say you have input files, maybe it was a bigger file before, and you have fruit names within the files. Okay, you split the, the these files into smaller manageable files, let's say a line each, it doesn't have to add, and you want to find, uh, uh, count the words, count the, the fruits in these files. So in the map phase, you create map maps, apple, one times, this is key, this is the value, orange one times, mango one times, so on and so forth. What is interesting here is apple one times, apple one times, apple one times, once, <laughs> apple again, once, and plum. Uh, so you see every line, you create key value pairs, apple once, orange once, mango once, here, apple once, apple once, plum once. Then you have sort and shuffle phase. <clears throat> and you have all apples here, all mangoes, grapes, oranges, plums, etc. Then you reduce key value pairs. You reduce these key value pairs to apple four, for instance, and the final output, you concatenate all the results, okay? This is basically how MapReduce works. Uh, you can introduce some uh, optimization here, like uh, remember we have here apple one time and apple one time. Instead, you can simply say that apple twice, then you have apple twice, apple once, apple once, so on and so forth. This may introduce some, I mean, if there are a lot of inter intermediate outputs here, this may provide you some optimization. You can use the same logic to, for joining large data sets. Uh, you have databases here and you want to join uh, tables, uh, you need a mapper to produce the join key and record pairs, key value pairs, okay? Mapper does that. Um, there's some shuffling and sorting. Uh, reducers perform the actual join here over the key value pairs. Uh, same thing actually. Uh, with MapReduce, um, there are tasks. So, what if a task fails? 
job tracker reschedules the task. I didn't uh, for mention about these uh, job tracking details, but of course something is going on in parallel. Uh, completely transparent to you. There are things to coordinate stuff. One of them is job tracker. Um, you have several MapReduce processes running in the uh, in the cluster. <coughs> they have to be orchestrated somehow. Um, and since you have a lot of tasks, some of them might fail. If that is the case, job tracker uh, reschedules them automatically. What if a data node fails? Uh, all tasks on the, the failed node are rescheduled on another node and the name node replicates the user's data to another node. But if a task is going slow, so it takes a long time, longer than it should, uh, the second copy of a task is launched by Hadoop or Job Tracker uh, or Job Manager on another node and both uh, keep working. Uh, whichever finishes the first, uh, its results are taken and the other one is killed afterwards. I'm about to finish this part. Um, you see, this is Oracle Big Data Appliance. Uh, the slide is few years old, maybe the names of the components changed. So in Oracle, you have Oracle NoSQL database, Oracle R, Oracle Enterprise Manager, and Oracle Big Data Appliance. And basically, Oracle provides you some data analytics tools. And within its suite of programs, it integrated Hadoop. Okay. This computer is not a big server. It has 16 or 32 cores. It's a small size server, a medium size server. Um, but Oracle says that I can integrate Hadoop into my big data appliance and do advanced analytics. And there's some future middleware. Uh, don't worry about the details of this Oracle big data appliance. I, ju I just want to say that Oracle somehow integrates Cloudera, Cloudera's Hadoop. Cloudera is like a distribution on Linux. Uh, within its uh, data analytic stack. Okay? It's just a marketing strategy. I'm not saying that this is a good way of using Hadoop because if I say Hadoop, I probably mean a lot of nodes, not few cores. Similar thing uh, for Teradata. It is another vendor like uh, Oracle. They also have this mid-sized server and they integrated within their bundle uh, Hortonworks Hadoop. Hortonworks is another uh, distribution. So uh, it may be a good starting point to work with Hadoop. They provide you a sandbox. It's a virtual machine image. And you can simply download and uh, execute it. Uh, it comes with Hadoop uh, installed already. And there are other components that I mentioned in the Hadoop ecosystem. You can simply play with them. They have nice tutorials. And I recently noticed that Cloudera, that I guess, bought this hard Hortonworks also, uh, I guess they are the same uh, company now. It doesn't matter. You can download this sandbox from Hortonworks or from Cloudera. Uh, you can play with that. Okay, I'd like to talk about uh, Apache Spark. 
it's an alternative to MapReduce. Uh, maybe a better alternative as well. Because you can also do stream. You can also work on streams with Spark. It's nice. Apache Spark and scalable machine learning. <clears throat> Your next assignment will be about uh, Spark. Uh, to remind you that it has shifted one meet for, uh, forward. Uh, you will get it next week. What is Apache Spark? It's a cluster computing platform designed to be fast and general purpose. Um, it extends the popular MapReduce model to efficiently support more types of computations, including interactive queries and stream processing. Um, okay, why Spark? Uh, current popular programming models for clusters transform data flow flowing from stable storage to stable storage. Okay, so it's like repeating IOs all the time. A cyclic data flow is powerful abstraction, but is not efficient for applications that repeatedly you reuse a working set of data. So if you look at here, if you are working with map reduce so there are iterations and after each iteration you read data you write something to the hdfs and again you uh, repeat this pattern this is not efficient and ioc realization can take 90 percent of the time with spark the idea with the spark is you read data and you try to work within the main memory so there are nodes in the cluster. Those nodes have main memory, and you use those memory uh, to do the computation. Of course, it's not always possible to stay completely within the memory, maybe because the data is too big. But if it fits and it is in the memory, and because of that, it is so fast and you cache data in the memory and you perform some kind of transformations we will be mentioning soon and then action okay then you have results so you need to have the uh, merge the results somehow if you look at the spark stack um let's talk about uh let's not talk about the details what is under the hood that there is something called the Spark Core. On top of this Spark Core, this is what we are interested in. Uh, there is SQL for uh, Spark SQL for structured data, Spark Streaming. It is very essential for real-time data processing. MLib is the machine learning library that you can. Um, it is like Scikit Learn. You have this library, you can use the, the algorithms available in this library to do machine learning on a large scale. Again, when I say large, I mean really big data. And you also have graphics for graph processing. Um, why, who is using Spark or why is using Spark? Data science tasks. Um, the key point here is Spark enables data scientists to tackle problems with larger data sizes than they could before with tools like R or Pandas or Python. And Spark provides a simple way to parallelize applications across clusters and hides the complexity of distributed systems, programming, network communication, and fault tolerance. Again, as I said in the previous lecture, so from outside, it's a single program, but within, the, uh, within it, uh, there is a lot of parallelization, message exchange, uh, network communication, and fault tolerance things happening. Okay. 
Before we continue with uh, Spark, let's talk about functional programming a little bit uh, because it is a basic. Uh, I mean, for Spark, Spark parallelizes computation by using this functional programming, or in other words, lambda calculus. You know uh, about lambda calculus a little bit because in the BBM 101, we talk about higher order functions. Uh, I'm pretty sure you remember lambda functions. We use lambda to create anonymous functions, as you may remember. If you don't, please go review your info, uh, your knowledge about that. Uh, it's based on the mathematical concept called lambda calculus. First implementation was Lisp. It was a programming language in the 50s, you see. It's very old. Uh, Haskell is part of every computer science curriculum since 90s. Haskell is another uh, programming language, functional programming language. Uh, Scala is the most representative of those uh, programming languages. And Scala, Python, R, and Java also uh, have rudimentary support for functional programming. And the core of this Spark, I guess, was written by using Scala. You may check that. So in the functional programming, we consider functions uh, like any other thing in the programming, uh, like variables. So you see, uh, let's say you call this alert function here. It calls the output function. Actually, it is a variable here, you see. It is a variable, but you assign a function to this variable. And now when you say that, you can call a function by using the variable's name. Uh, then you can send another function as an argument to a function. So you see it's a weird thing, but it is also handy. Let's say you have list of values and you want to increment every value in the list. How would you do that? You can simply create this function fx, which increments x by one. Um, you can simply apply this function to a list and every member in the list will be incremented. So it will be applied as element wise. So this is the whole idea actually. If you were to do this thing by using simple programming, you would have this loop, and within this loop, you would increment every uh, every number within the list. But with functional programming, it is simpler than that. And you can also uh, use parallelization like this. To do the parallelization, maybe you need to split the data first into three, or you split the data in among the, the, the three nodes. And you can simply send the function to those nodes and uh, function will be evaluated on those nodes and you can simply collect the results, okay? Um, since on HDFS data is already uh, distributed among nodes, uh, HDFS seems like a good uh, storage option to uh, execute Spark on, but Spark can work on any other. Uh, so if you are using MapReduce, you need to use HDFS. Uh, but if you are using Spark, you don't have to use HDFS. You can use HDFS, but you can use other storage options, even uh, ordinary files, you can use them. Uh, let's look at the code, how you can code this. Um, in Spark, we have something resilient distributed data set. It is the core element. Um, so you can call this parallelize method to parallelize these hundred numbers. <clears throat> and then you can simply 
what this code does is it creates 100 numbers from 0 to 99, okay, and parallelize them. I mean, or store them in a parallelized data structure. You can, you can think that there is something like 100 components in the cluster. It doesn't have to be that way, of course. And, and each node in the cluster has one number. So this is what parallelization means. And there is another function method here, map. Uh, lambda x, x plus one increments the values. So this is like uh, head in data frames on pandas. So it returns the first 10 elements. So typically since we are dealing with uh, huge data, I mean, we don't want to return all data to the client because sometimes it will take so long, okay. Um, so this is the output of it. Um, actually, I had another example. Okay, which I forgot to add here. Anyhow, I will add that. I will give another example uh, or other examples on that. Let's talk about this resilient distributed data sets. Uh, in Spark, we express our computation through operations on distributed collections that are automatically parallelized across the cluster. So you see, there are partitions distributed among the cluster, and this is completely transparent to us. You simply call parallelize method. So these collections are called resilient distributed data sets, and it sparks fundamental abstraction for distributed data and computation. It is also possible to distribute data frames uh, since part 2.0.0, a data frame is a data set organized into named columns. So you see, you can even distribute, distribute data frames, okay? On Pandas, you had data frames. Remember, we, we like data sets, uh, data frames, sorry, uh, because it's a nice data structure to have. It provides us a lot to do a lot of things. And imagine now that data frame is distributed. And also imagine that we are working with huge data. I mean, if you didn't have this data distributed, it will take a lot of time to uh, process. But now it is also distributed across a cluster, data frame itself. So you see, it's a nice thing to have. Transformations and actions on RDDs. Um, we have RDDs, we create them by parallelizing and we can apply some transformations, okay? Then after the transformations, we can apply actions. Uh, let's go to this. <coughs> uh, to see what kind of transformations we have. So this is the Spark documentation, basically. Where is it? Basic transformations, okay. So these are the transformations you can run. Map, return a new distributed data set formed by passing each element of the source through a function func, okay. Filter, map, filter, return a new data set formed by selecting those elements of the source on which function returns true. Uh, there are other things here, reduce by key, for instance, join, uh, and there are actions, reduce, aggregate the elements of data set using a function, this function should be commutative and associative, blah, blah, blah, and collect. Return all the elements of the data set as an array at the driver program, okay? So now we hear something called driver program. Driver program is the, the program that runs your uh, Spark uh, 
job. Um, I will give an example on that. Take n, return an array with the first n elements of the data set. Count, return the number of elements in the data set. And probably there are some other things. If you go to uh, Spark documentation, you can find this information here. So the thing is transformations are lazy. You simply apply a transformation to a data set and it is, I mean, just executed yet. Only it ex uh, transformations are only computed when an action requires a result to be returned to the driver program, okay? Uh, you may also persist an RDD in memory using the persist method or cache method. So I will give an example on that, I guess, as far as I remember. Good. So components for distributed execution in Spark. Um, at a high level, every Spark application consists of a driver program. In this case, it's here. That launches various parallel operations on clusters. This part is transparent to you. The driver program contains your application's main function and defines distributed data sets on the cluster, then applies operations to them. So if you look at this example, it's a Python code. So you simply read the text file, assume this is a huge file, and lines it can get the count. Okay, it's not a huge file, 127 lines, and you get the first item in this RDD. Of course, it doesn't make sense to have this example yet because we don't know the content of this readme file. Anyhow, you can return the first line. So the thing here is when you read this file, you can, uh, you create RDD. It's like a worker nodes have lines uh, of this text file. I mean, we could consider 120, I mean, in the, in the nice base, uh, I'm not going to call it base case. We could have 127 components and or worker nodes, they would have line each, but probably it's not the, the, the reality. Let's look at this example, log mining. Uh, load error messages from a log into memory that interactively search for various patterns. Um, Spark.txt file, it reads this file from HDFS, you, you check that, and create the base RDDs, and it filters lines that start with error. We are, we are only interested in error messages. Uh, then we have transformed the RDD, sorry. And uh, split tab second. I mean, we are trying to probably get the error message within, the, within this uh, log line and cache it. But Nothing happened yet. If you if you look at the worker nodes, nothing happened yet. We are just applying transformations. Then filter lines that contains full and get the count of them. It's a parallel operation. Um, so what is going to happen now is, so you will read I mean, the driver program will, will initiate things. Uh, data will be read and results will return to uh, driver program. Now they will be cached, okay? So uh, this cache method is applied now. So the thing here is the results are cached in the main memory so that if we need to read that again, we don't have to do the entire thing from the beginning. Caching is nice because we are looking for now cache in the cached messages, lines that contain bar. So we can simply read from the caches. Okay, they are already in the cache. That's nice. We don't do the entire thing from the beginning. Good. Uh, and so on and so forth. We can add a lot of things to um, <clears throat> to this code. Let's, 
I mean, you can simply say that full text search on Wikipedia is less than one second. It will be something like 20 seconds for on this data. So you see 20 times faster using a Apache uh, as part. Uh, what is the situation with uh, machine learning? If you do logistic regression by using Hadoop, uh, you see blue are for Hadoop, red for Spark. In the beginning, for number of iterations, uh, Spark has some kind of overhead. You need to start you know, tasks, etc. But if the number of iterations increases, then you see Spark is uh, so much powerful than Hadoop, you see. It's less than 500 while this goes to 4,000, something like that. This is because the IO overhead Hadoop comes with, okay? So that's why Spark is preferred when it comes to machine learning at large uh, scale. Okay. Um, for this part, I'd like to show you something else. Okay, there are some numbers here. Uh, so the first iteration takes uh, 174 seconds for Spark, whereas it is 127 seconds. Uh, but further iterations take so much less, six versus 127. This is because of the uh, uh, caching effect or Hadoop uses main memory to operate data. Uh, uh, sorry, Spark is using a memory to, uh, for, uh, to store data to operate. Hadoop is doing so much I.O. Anyhow, good. I'd like to continue with uh, something else. Uh, okay. I see some of you are using uh, this sort of stuff like uh, Google Cloud, IBM Cloud, or I don't know if there's any uh, Microsoft Cloud for free. Uh, you use that. Um, uh, for your projects, the SCP projects, probably if you are working with images, you may need to use this sort of things. I like to I don't know if any of you ever tried this IBM Cloud. Uh, if you log in, if you sign up, it provides you. I'm not trying to do any advertisement, by the way. Uh, I just wanted to show you some code uh, regarding the uh, regarding Pi Spark. Uh, Spark. <laughs> um, I'm not going to go to. IBM Cloud Pack or something like that. IBM Cloud Pack. What is it? Cloud Pack for data. Okay. Right now. I already have. Do I have this? Hmm. Okay. Uh, what the call? Yes. I hope I remember my passwords. No. Mm. Okay, this is a demo effect, I guess.
log in and end. Yes. Okay, I made it. So, uh, I didn't go to cloud.ibm.com directly. Instead, I, get, I got to this cloud pack for data. It's a kind of platform for you to play with. Um, what you could do is you can try projects. Uh, you can create projects. Uh, I created this test project. I can create another one. Uh, okay, I'll go to. I'm not going to create another one now. Uh, instead, I will do something like you see, I will add something to my project. Uh, what I can add is there are a lot of things. If you go to cloud.ibm.com, for instance, you have millions of things to uh, play with. Here we have more uh, organized things, uh, things you may need in your data science project. I want to create a notebook, for instance. Notebook. I will call this notebook one. Uh, it's Python 3.7. So you see uh, two virtual CPUs and eight gigabytes of RAM. So you can select, you have different alternatives here as an environment, runtime environment. Um, but the thing here in the beginning, you are given only 50, uh, unit of something, I don't know. And if you choose this environment, it says it consumes one capacity unit per hour. I mean, in the beginning, you have only 50, you need to consider this and you may want to create a, a smaller configuration for this. You can get the file from uh, anywhere. I found something on internet, I'm going to use it. A guide simply, uh, okay. I found this on internet, as I said. It shows stuff. Now you can create a notebook. I was going to show you the same thing by using Google Cloud. And last night I noticed that my account expired somehow. I don't have free credits anymore. So I tried IBM Cloud. So I'm not really familiar with it, but you see the thing is here. The thing here is if you are familiar with one tool, uh, tools of one vendor, probably you can figure out what is going on with the others. Um, this uh, notebook, let's import this stuff. Uh, of course, PySpark is not there. This is not good. Uh, let's go to, we need to import this somehow. Uh, leave page, I will leave page, oh. Damn it. Okay, this is uh, again. I will add another notebook. We need the code to uh, notebook name. Notebook to 
I will get this notebook. Again, I found this on internet, so you can try anything. The problem was the environment was not for Spark, yes, okay. So it takes time to, you see, continue set kernel. Uh, let's say what is going on here. We need to install PySpark, right? You can simply install it. It takes some time, but it works eventually. <laughs> we go probably. Successfully installed. Good. Uh, what I could do here is let's try this notebook. Let's spark context, get or create. We do this to get the spark context so that we can parallelize things. Remember, we have 100 numbers, parallelize them. I guess it's a kind of exercise we can count the elements. You see, we have 100 elements. Let's try to see what is this. So you see, it's a Python RDB, Resilient Distributed Data Set. And you can get the sum of numbers on this. Good. So this is the sum of numbers from 0 to 99. Let's go to, uh, I want, may I open this on another window? Uh, where is my notebook? Maybe. Six, okay. This is my notebook the first notebook I wanted to create. Uh, it didn't work before, but now it should. Uh. Okay, it is a little slow. Okay, I will add this again. From this URL. Let's call this notebook three. Now this should work because I already imported Spark, yeah, installed PySpark. Let's say I create a context for Spark, local four. Four denotes number of cores here, four cores. I mean, if I don't have four cores, what is going to happen? So let's see. You can simply say that the okay cannot run multiple show. Of course, we need to stop this first. Anyhow, let's create random integers. I will make this bigger if you can see that. And print the list. This is the num uh, random integers. 10, 
one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twenty integers. Okay, let's parallelize it. Okay, so basically we created an RDD called A here. Let's see the type of it. Let's say Pi Spark RDD. Um, execute this. I'm just executing again so that it to show you that it really works. Collect is the operation. Uh, brings all the distributed elements and returns the them to the head node. So collect collect data items uh, uh, distributed to the nodes in the Spark cluster, basically. How were the partitions created? For that, we have GLOM method. Now you will see one, two, three, and four. Remember, in the beginning, we said uh, uh, four uh, nodes. If there's a question, yes, Emre? You can stop the context and we can create again by using two nodes and parallelize this the same list and collect the glom you see one two so you are parallelizing things by using two worker nodes okay we will call them worker nodes and okay let's redo this i don't know why but i will follow the directions of this not notebook We can count the elements in the RDD. Remember, we had 20 uh, num uh, numbers. We can return the first one. We can return the for, uh, four of the elements. Again, we shouldn't return all elements uh, by mistake because if the since the data is too big in the normal case, we don't do that. We can return distinct elements. So you see, we can simply return distinct elements. It's like working with uh, Python, you know, lists. I mean, there are some minor differences, of course. There are some differences, but it is completely transparent to you. So you are working with distributed data and you are not even aware of that. Uh, we can create a lambda function to sum all the elements. We can use the reduce method. So the reduce method basically uh, does computation, then takes the next element, does the computation, takes the ne next element. So if you are, let's say you are doing this sum operation, for instance, uh, of course, I'm not going to do that. So what you do is you add one to two, then your data becomes like uh, this. Then uh, six, not, where is it? Uh, then it becomes six plus four plus five. So you see, this is how reduce works. Or you can simply say a dot sum. It does the same thing. No worries. Um, I don't know this whole method. It's okay. 
finding maximum elements by using the radius. Again, you have this lambda function. Uh, it returns x if x greater than y, else it returns y. So you simply reduce this function to the list of data you have on the RDBs. So the reduce operation will be performed. Uh, these are some of the best Macintosh computers ever. So you can split this sentence into words and you want to find the longest word. You parallelize words. So you see, it doesn't make sense since the data is so small, but assume this data is so big, okay? Just so big. And you can simply reduce and you again have a lambda function. It returns W if the length of W is greater than length of V as it returns V. Let's see what it returns. It will return computers, Macintosh, and it should return Macintosh. Um, we can use filter methods. So again, uh, a filter method, sorry. Filter and a function. Function is again a lambda function, is an anonymous function. Uh, it returns x. If x mod 3 is 0, then it, you collect. Um, what else you can do? You can do mapping. Uh, you create a map. So map means it will return squares of data. Okay. Let's see, I don't collect. So you see, B is the squared version of A. Um, there are other examples here, you can work on that. What else you can do? I mean, you can do many things. Let's say, um, Yes. Şey sure. Bunlar için hani işte yeni bir tane RDD dönüyor diyor ya, return ediyor diyor ya. Hı hı. E, yani paralelleştirilmemiş bir şekilde mi dönüyor? Collect deyince mi? Yok. Yani mesela bir tane filter vardı. İşte onu evet. bir şey assign ettiğim zaman ben yine 4 core'dan RDD çekiyorum. RDD geliyor. Evet, RDD dönüyor. Tamam, peki hala 4 core'da mı yoksa 1'e mi düşüyor? Ee, dört kor. Yani o, o değişmiyor. Ee, RDD dönüyor. RDD'de paralel olmak durumunda zaten. RDD deyince zaten başka şansın yok. O zaten default paralel. Ya tabii e, iki tane eleman dönecekse dört olmayacak haliyle. Değil mi? <gülüyor> tamam. tamam sağ ol. Burada şunu hiçbir zaman unutma. Biz çok büyük veriyle çalışıyoruz. Bunu hiçbir zaman unutmayın. Ee, o yüzden zaten her zaman paralel oluyor bu. Şöyle basit e, bakayım. Şurada bir tane örnek yapmıştım. Ona bakayım bulabileceğim de. Um, you can simply get this file. Um, it is now available to you. So file open index.html. You can simply play with this. Um, print f. Of course, you cannot. You need to read, right? So you see, it's nice. You can work with files that you download. Uh, you can get the number of there are three hundred and fifty-one lines. 
or what we can say is, I guess it is, um, we can create this like, um, I'll try to find the code here. Yes. List file. List file that. Actually, it is the same thing. List file. Let's try to find this. So you see, it's in my partitions RDD again. Uh, if you do that, the file is read uh, and RDDs are created. Um, what else you can do? List file. So you see, on the disk file, I can do a map function. Okay. Map function will simply return the length of each line on the file. Then I can uh, execute reduce to find the the total uh, sum of the length of. Uh, no. I find the length of every line and I do a cumulative sum of that by using this lambda function. And this is the length of the, the total sum of li uh, line lengths. <laughs> uh, so it's so stupid that I couldn't uh, uh, phrase it correctly. But the thing here is you can do a lot of things. And these things are happening in parallel. And always consider that these data files are so huge. Okay. Otherwise, it doesn't make so much sense. Okay, this was one example that I wanted to show you. I will try to answer questions if there are any now.